Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, and well, to those of you who are not in the Philippines, good afternoon, or in the cases of some people like my brother, who I know is watching, my brother, my brother in law. Hi, good evening from New Jersey. Okay, I'm going to switch this now to share screen. All right. Here we go. Can everyone? Can everyone hear me and see me? Yes, sir, we can. Okay, so audio is okay, video is okay. All right, here we go. On the 35th anniversary of EDSA, or the People Power Revolution, I think it's only appropriate that this lecture be given now, especially because a generation and a half since the revolution that toppled the dictatorship, much has happened no, not just in our country, in the world, but more importantly, for purposes of this lecture, much has happened in how we perceive, how we remember, and how we choose to act about EDSA today, right? So I'm going to give, the, uh, for the next 50 or so minutes, my take on what EDSA 35 means, All right? I've been a professor of history for the last, I've been a professor of history for the last 30, for the last 20 or so years. And when we talk about history, there are three definitions. The first definition is something like this. It is what is history as an objective thing. In other words, it is what has happened. In many grade schools, in many high schools, history in the classroom is defined as the past. So I guess for argument's sake, let us say that one definition of history is what has happened. Okay? It is, it is the objective history. Everything that's happened in the past, whether we know it or not, whether we understand it properly or not, but definitely what has already happened, including, in this instance, the EDSA People Power Revolution. Okay? But, it, but history can also be defined as an academic discipline. So as in, in my particular case, as a historian, there is history as it is taught in the classroom. History is lectured, for example, like now on, online, and history appears in textbooks, okay? What you see here on the screen is a subject I created, an elective in history I created three years ago. Well, it's 2021, sorry, my bad, four years ago is called Memory and Martial Law in the Philippines. It was my attempt as a history professor to teach a particular course on martial law and how it is remembered because I felt that it is not enough to teach martial law as part of a, of a larger history subject, but rather because of its complexity, its legacy and how it affects us today, it deserves its own course, okay? But because I'm a history professor, it has nevertheless to be taught within the particular rules of discipline. Certain methods, certain standards, certain ways of teaching it clearly, concisely, and fairly. But at the same time, because it is taught as a discipline, it cannot cover everything. Okay? If there is objective history, what has happened, well, in the classroom, I, I tell students, I've told students for almost 25 years, you cannot completely teach history objectively in the classroom. So even if, for example, it is a course on memory and martial law, there is no way I can cover it completely. And there is no way for me to avoid teaching it from a certain perspective. When I taught History 172, the idea was to, to create not just lectures within the classroom, okay, to my students specifically, but to a larger audience. So I provided 10 public lectures wherein I invited 10 speakers to talk about different things. Media and martial law, social, uh, the church and martial law, economics and martial law, literature and martial law, memory and martial law. But each one of those came from a certain perspective. So even within the parameters of history's academic discipline, there is a certain subjectivity that creates um, an imperfect teaching. It is as best as it could because it's academic discipline, but it will never be completely objective. And then there's the third type of history. And this is what this lecture here today is all about. The third one is history defined as a narrative. 
remembered by society. Every individual remembers events in a particular way. But in the last 20 or so years, is a new discipline has emerged. It's called social memory. It is how institutions teach memory, or more specifically, it is how institutions teach history in a certain way to be remembered in a certain way. So it is a institution, for example, like church, family, government, political groups, institutions, foundations, wherein history is taught from a certain approach for certain motivations, for certain motives, for certain purposes, whether true or not, whether to teach it to, uh, an aspect of the truth, in some cases a tweaking of the truth, or in some cases a complete lie about the truth. But because it is perceived as correct, it is where the narrative as taught in that society can lead to many tragic uh, mistakes, tragic misconceptions, and therefore tragic consequences for how our future will be shaped. Okay? So like in this particular thing on the screen, uh, there are certain websites out there now that teach that a certain royal family, the Talianos, supposedly a prehistory royal family, supposedly gave uh, ruled an area, the kingdom of Maharlika, it's actually huge, it's actually bigger than the United States. And this royal family apparently gave, or allegedly gave the Marcus family hundreds and th of thousands of gold bars. It is a particular mistruth that has been passed on in the last five or so years, which ironically does not even appear within Marcus's own, well, pseudo-biography, Tadhana. And in fact, it has thousands of likes, thousands of shares, but it shows you that history as can be manipulated to be remembered in a particular way, a narrative is twisted in a particular way, and if you're not careful, society will carry on that memory for, the, for well, as long as someone does not show it is false, okay? Now, let's go to EDSA proper. What are the reals of EDSA? The, the things that we cannot really argue about. One, EDSA was a response to 20 years of Marcus misrule, of Marcus dictatorship, okay? It was a desperate attempt by millions of people to try and bring down 20 years of autocracy, of tyranny, okay? That's one. Furthermore, EDSA could not have been possible, and you can't really argue about this, EDSA could not have been possible without a failed military coup involving Fidel V. Ramos, and Juan Ponce in Rile. It began there. And from because the coup failed, the attempt to, to seize power to establish a junta, it led to a call to popular support, okay, from civil society and from the Catholic Church. So these are the origins of EDSA. Uh, what this failed coup attempt did, it allowed people to channel their frustration and their anger into a popular movement in support of a coup, but not to establish the junta, but rather to establish a true democratic society, which was denied by the massive cheating in the February 7 snap election. Okay, What Cory Aquino established in February of 1986, just in the beginning, was a coalition government. It included both political as both members, of political left and political right. So you would find people who are part of the left spectrum and the right spectrum in the center. So it was a wide coalition, which normally would not occur, but because there were so many different groups that were involved in the people power movement and so many groups that were anti-Marcos, that the coalition government was created and by definition, unstable. Okay, so that was the kind of government Corey had at least for the first one or two years of her administration. But EDSA was also about the restoration of democratic institutions that had been manipulated or controlled or completely shut down by Marcos. For example, EDSA allowed the restoration of freedom of the press, which disappeared in 1972. EDSA allowed local and congressional elections, which had been controlled since martial law, since 1978 and 1981, 1984. So free elections finally restored, okay? And most importantly, EDSA allowed the frame 1987 constitution, which emphasizes limits on executive power and tremendous emphasis on social justice and helping the poor. Okay. And that 1987 constitution 
uh, in, in effect, ended the, the authority which Marx claimed was his from the 1973 constitution. It was supposed to bring about great changes in our society. Okay, and it's still the one used today. Cory Kino also gained tremendous international respect and support. Here she is now talking to American President Ronald Reagan in the White House. Cory Kino was later able to speak in front of the American Congress and later in front of the United Nations. She received international recognition by countries abroad, was invited to talk abroad, received international awards, okay? And later, the People Power Revolution served as a model for other countries around the world to show popular demonstration, popular support against dictatorship, okay? What else was there? Cory Kino ordered the creation of the Presidential Commission on Good Government, the PCGG. The PCGG's main task was to recover the ill-gotten Ill wealth of the Marcos family, their friends, and their relatives. Cory Kino also ordered the creation of the Commission on Human Rights. The CHR was supposed to was supposed to file cases against people who had had their political and civil rights violated, especially those who come from the poorest sectors of society, to those who are underrepresented, those who are normally unable to fight for justice on their own. So these are creations of Cory Kino, and this part of the legacy that they have created. Okay. Now, moving on, but the problems with EDSA were a lot. Multitude. So even if we could say that Cory Kino was able to restore democratic institutions, was able to create aspects of government that was supposed to, to fight back against what was created by Marcos or what was stolen by Marcos and his friends in order to defend what was lost against Marcos, her problems were immense. For example, the Philippine economy in the last in the first part of the eight of the 1980s took a serious nosedive. The economy in essence, in terms of inflation, in terms of dollar salting, in terms of unemployment, were massive. The foreign debt we had inherited from Marcos was massive. And the devaluation of the peso, okay, was also a huge problem we had to deal with. We lost a lot of our money and a lot of our reserves and a lot of our own manpower who had fled the country to work abroad in the last years of martial law. So Cory Aquino had to work against that. Right? It did not help, but whether we would like to admit or not, Cory Kim's own tremendous political inexperience, that even if we were to say that she meant well, a lot of her problems were created or exacerbated by her own inability to really comprehend what was going on. Okay? So we talk about economic problems, political problems, and the limits of Cory Kino's own leadership style and her own administration. It would be very unrealistic to claim that she was a perfect president, but in fact, more fair to her to say that there were many mistakes made, even if she meant well, but nevertheless, those, made, those mistakes made would have repercussions on what we are today. Okay? Our economic recovery also suffered from six failed coup attempts, including the worst one in 1989, right? And also worsened by the 1990 earthquake in Luzon and 1991 Pitubo eruption. In other words, our best attempts to recover, to bring back what had been lost, were hampered, faced obstacles created by our own weaknesses, by natural disasters, and by a very politicized military, which is not happy with the way the Cory administration was, was well, ruling the Philippines since EDSA also did not help that because democracy was restored, it also allowed the return of many traditional politicians, many who had lost power since martial law, or many who after martial law were now trying to, to continue their power. And because many traditional politicians preferred the status quo before martial law, it meant that a lot of vital legislation, for example, true land reform, or we can say establishing legislation that would have real anti-dynasty laws were denied. So a lot of what Corey could have done using her own power, she now passed on to Congress. And Congress, of course, chose to work in its own best interest and prevent a lot of the changes that the ordinary Filipino wanted after EDSA, right? But at the very end of the story, perhaps Corey's greatest legacy 
is that he was able to peacefully turn over power in clear on elections in 1992 to Fidel V. Ramos. In other words, to restore to the Philippines something we had lost, the right to choose our own leader after free election, and for that leader to take power peacefully. That was Corey's last legacy in 1992. Now, this is where it has been very dicey, okay? There are many lies that have circulated about EDSA and many lies about the people behind EDSA, the people who were overthrown in EDSA, and the people who have since EDSA been able to come back to power and prominence. For example, it should be noted that prior to 2010, no Marcos had won national election. Imelda Marcos ran for the presidency in 1992 and lost. In 1998, she wanted to run again, but decided with just a few days before the actual election, decided to withdraw. Because it's getting increasingly clear she could not win. So what has been done, perhaps in the last 10 or so years, there's been a very concerted effort to exaggerate okay, the failures of the Cory Aquino government and everything after her, all the way up to the Nino Aquino administration, they call, uh, the, the, what is used in social media, whether it be in fan pages, on Facebook, in lectures by pseudo historians, is to talk about 30 years of, of darkness. Ironically, including the presidents between Cory and Pinoy, who have actually thrown their support behind the current administration. So there's a lot of exaggeration, but what's going on also uh, uh, over the the failures, they're not exaggerations, or in fact, they're outright lies in some cases. And on the other hand, an overemphasis over the accomplishments of the Marcoses, is, uh, if not exaggeration, outright lies on the other hand. So there are many mistruths that are floating around, but these are not just random mistruths. What we have are systematic buildups, uh, systematic buildup of social media manipulation, okay? where you will have multiple sites, multiple pages online, which are showing the same material, the same mistruth, the same falsities, okay? Which wherein if you are not careful, you will end up falling for it, okay? And these were done in preparation for 2016 elections, and they are still being used today. So these are the lies about how Marcus, uh, during Marcus' time, it was two pesos is to one dollar. That is not true. We would have the first airport in Asia. That is not true. Under Marcus with his uh, second best economy in Asia, not true, and so forth and so on. So there has been a great propaganda effort, as you can see it here, okay, shared by sites and controlled by the same social media, wherein there is a lot of sharing, there's a lot of likes, and there's and even when there are attempts to disprove, even attempts to show it is not true, even attempts to dis debunk, the sites merely go on their way. They don't argue, they don't, and of course the people who benefit are not going to say, yeah, these sites are not true either. So this is what we are facing today, right? So the legacy of EDSA has been tarnished, has been manipulated, in some cases been totally demolished in the name of private interests of other people, right? For example, here in an interview of Juan Fonsidrile of Bongbong Bong Marcos in 2018, they talked about how within martial law, only one person was killed, that there were no massacres in the war in Mindanao, that the Jabida massacre in Corridor did not happen. So you would have barefaced lies on national TV. So this part again of the build up to show that certain things did not happen, certain things did happen, certain things happened a certain way or did not happen a certain way in order to control, to manipulate, in order to influence public opinion, right? So these examples of, yes, there's objective history. Yes, there's history in the classroom, but there's also history as narrative. And over the last perhaps since EDSA, especially in the last 10 or 10 years or so, that social media, that attempt to control the narrative has increased, right? And attempts 
to reduce that manipulation have been very difficult. So what are these challenges to memory? It should be noted, no? and I've told students in the classroom for the longest time, is that in the Philippines, and in general, no? especially the Philippines, we have a history of very selective remembering. In other words, when we have had something unfortunate happen to us, we tend to forget about. It. It's like we would rather move on, or rather we would not deal with, perf with, with painful things, painful moments in our history. Okay? And in fact, our, our, our habit is we do not just downplay or forget, but oftentimes we end up praising the very people who have hurt us. For example, Filipinos normally tend to say, oh, there was a Philippine-American war, or let's not talk about, instead let's talk about Americans bringing us democracy, bringing us free election, bringing us English and education. Or we could talk about, say, Spain. We could talk, we could say that Spain, for example, brought us Catholicism, Spain, Spain brought us uh, Western ideas, brought us together as a nation, and tend to downplay a lot of the a lot of the difficulties and hardships Philippines endured under 300 plus years of Spanish rule, or in the case of martial law. What is normally emphasized are the infrastructure of the Marcos, created by the Marcos, much, Marcos, much of which is actually not that very helpful, or accomplishments that were not even true, and instead downplaying or not talking about a lot of the problems, the horrors, the torture, the deaths, the stealing, the plunder of martial law. Okay? Maybe it doesn't help that it is very difficult to be critical of social media. After all, it does take a certain effort to say or to really check, is social media correct? Is social media accurate? For example, on this site, uh, this, this um, Marcus, Marcus fan page website, it claims that it has only been secretly revealed that Corey Aquino requested for American airstrikes on the rebels in 1989 coup attempt. That's not a secret. It is common knowledge. But what propaganda does, what false social media does, is to say it has been hidden, and therefore it is, they call it hidden history. That actually we need to know the truth about Corey Aquino and truth about EDSA, truth about her administration, that, 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 that. If you think carefully, these were things that were never hidden. But if you're not careful, you're going to believe it, it was hidden, and therefore, it creates misimpressions of what really happened in the first six years of the government established after EDSA. Okay? Other complications. We have to realize that because of the very slow grind and recovery of hidden wealth, there have been um, propaganda saying that there have been no victories, no recoveries against Marcos and the cronies and the friends and the relatives. That's not true. Actually, much has been recovered but much still has to be recovered. People will say that there have been not enough triumphs of the people who suffered from martial law, the people suffering from human rights violations. That's not true either, okay? There have been victories in court by the people who suffered under martial law, but the fact is justice remains very slow. In many cases, it remains elusive, but the argument has that's been done the propaganda manipulation is because there have supposedly no victories in court therefore nothing has been stolen or because supposedly there have been no victories by human rights victims therefore there have been no human rights violations this is the way it has been done this is the way memory has been manipulated this is the way the narrative has been shifted against truth okay not only have the Marcoses never really left, this was on the morning of the Marcoses inauguration on the, on the Malacanang lawn of February 25, 1992. It will include pictures, for example, of Bongbong and Irene who claimed that they were minors during martial law and knew nothing. That was not true. They were already in, they were already in their 20s and knew quite well what was going on, okay? But not only have the Marx never really left, they went to exile for a while, but this is what makes it very hard 
to talk about the victory of EDSA. The fact that they are back and the fact that the dictator was recently buried a hero. It is very hard to convince people okay, that EDSA was a success, EDSA was a victory when the burial of the former president can be misconstrued as a vindication. So this is what, again, we are talking about here, how there have been many forts in the highway of EDSA. There have been many forts in memory because there has been a tremendous effort to undo the memory of EDSA, to undo the accomplishments of EDSA, and to undo how far we have gone, right? So this is further compounded, right? by the fact that because 35 years of EDSA, the ordinary Filipino could arguably say that a lot of the things we wanted in EDSA are still not there. And therefore the argument can, be go, can go like this. Traditional politics since EDSA have not really brought about the change. And therefore there is a, has been a, a counter movement towards populism that if, for example, liberal politics, if, for example, normal politics does not work, we should turn to populism. In the last five years, there have been many failures of a pop this populist government. But because, again, the machinery that has been in place since 2010, 2011 is so good, it downplays the failures of this current administration and instead says, well, it was much worse back then, or there's no problem now. It is it, that what the propaganda now is actually the propaganda of those who are traditional politicians. It is the propaganda of those who want to continue lying about what really happened at EDSA. See, this is again what I'm talking about, the way memory is played, the way memory is downplayed one way or the way it is upplayed another way. Okay, so what therefore should be done? What should EDSA in hindsight really be? First, we need to recognize that EDSA from the very beginning was a spontaneous movement. The four days of EDSA were not planned. In other words, there was no room whatsoever for any real strategic planning and therefore unable to have any setting of realistic objectives. It was a hour by hour, day by day it would be impossible for people to actually say, okay, let's do a realistic planning. What do we do this year or next year or the of that? What do we want in faculty in six years? So because of a lot of playing by ear, it would be very difficult to say EDSA actually had a plan, a direction, a clear objective from the beginning. Not help that people power itself, it took place in a very critical, unstable moment in history. If you remember, if you're old enough to remember, a few days after, the a week after the election, Corey Aquino was calling, calling for civil disobedience. Okay, we were on the verge of civil war. The communist insurgency was very strong and very influential. And the Marxist administration is becoming increasingly desperate. In other words, everything that happened during EDSA was compounded by the fact we were in a very dangerous a very unstable, a very unsure point in our history. As I pointed out earlier, it was hard to plan. It's hard to talk about direction. And a lot of what was done was knee-jerk. What do we do to solve certain problems now? The bigger picture was very hard, if not impossible, to think about. Okay? So these are the realities of EDSA that we have to recognize. And because there were many unrealistic hopes of EDSA, because we thought, okay, once Marcos is out, everything, and I mean everything will change, he will much, be much, much better. But it does not work that way. When I teach in the classroom, I tell students, change almost always comes very slowly. And EDSA, the aftermath of EDSA, the six years of the Kido administration is no exception. So immediate reforms were doomed to fail. The expectations we may have had were doomed to fail. 
So perhaps the same way we have very unrealistic expectations, in the same way the frustrations we had, the disappointments we had were just as great. Okay? Therefore, now, these obvious disappointments and Ed's aftermath has led to unfair historical judgment of the event itself. Okay? And ironically, and I only put this in this, this morning when I, was, when I thought about very carefully, the very values fought for at EDSA are rejected today. For example, EDSA was fought to restore human rights. But if you look at the war on drugs today, human rights has gone out the door. Freedom of the press has been greatly threatened by the assault on ABS-CBN and on Rappler. Or attempts to restore national sovereignty are challenged today. When we ask, when we ask ourselves today, exactly what, where are the borders of our country? Or when we talk about the limits of executive power, we start to wonder about exactly how much power does a president really have? These are the questions which we are, ch are challenged us today. In other words, did we really succeed at EDSA? Because in many ways, a lot of us who fought for ed our EDSA are actually being ignored, bypassed, or in fact, devalued, not important. That is the one tragedy we talk about. So where is the conclusion here for? We talk about going beyond 35. Going beyond 35, the values we cherish most appear in what we choose to remember and forget. When I teach Philippine history, I tell students now, what are we really about as a people? Perhaps if we think about the fact that we only have as of now one or one, or I think a few more martial law museums speaks volumes. The fact that we do not yet have a full length movie about the events of Edsa itself, that speaks volumes, okay? In The Kingmaker, uh, a documentary, Imelda Marcos said, perception is reality, the truth is not real. Okay, this is what I am getting at. Oftentimes, we need to see what exactly are the values we are holding. What values do we want? Are we really a people who are all about resiliency? In the last few years, especially in the last year, the pandemic, people said we should admire the Philippines. We are so resilient. But perhaps we should not talk about resiliency itself and more go about not just resiliency, but recognizing what is the problem? What are we resilient about? And instead talk about what are the problems that need to be solved, the long-term problems need to be resolved. And then we should not just accept the way things are, but to assert of what must be done. These are the values of the people that we are. That we need to talk less resiliency, more recognition, less acceptance, more assertion, okay? And part of this recognition of the problem has to be what has not been solved since EDSA and therefore assert what must be done because we have many fields of EDSA, what must be done now. We are also people who like to say bahalana, okay? We are, we are people who like to say, don't worry, it will work out better in the end. Or worse, we are people who will say, well, history will just repeat itself. There's nothing we can do. I like to teach my students that instead of looking at what have limited us in the past, rather we need to look at what are moments that precisely show we are not bound by history, that we are in fact freer than we have ever thought. So when we look, for example, the Bantay de Mabayani, this is an example of people who said, I will not be satisfied with the way things are, and I will in fact find a way to go more, to be more. I will find a way to show people that what the status quo can be changed, that history will repeat itself only if you let it. And in fact, if we look at our history, and the memory of EDSA and the memory of all those people who fought so hard at EDSA, those people who fought so hard at martial law, we shall in fact be empowered. In many countries abroad where dictatorship was brought down, people made a tremendous effort to remember. 
for example, were they able to have truth commissions or were they able to have uh, memorials to the people who were lost during dictatorship or in some countries actually distribute books to all the people to give records of what happened during dictatorship such that people will not forget, okay? In one essay I wrote, I wrote in Facebook about EDSA in martial law, I said, you know, at the end of this, you can actually sum it down in four words. Never forget, never again, right? Perhaps it is important that at the end of the day, we need to have a proper appreciation for EDSA for what it was. A spontaneous revolution wherein people who were so tired of dictatorship decided to take it upon themselves to do a popular movement never done before and see what we can do about bringing it down. There was no real planning, no clear objectives, and no unified idea of what to do next. Okay? So we need a proper appreciation for EDSA for what it was. It was not supposed to be a, a change all, an improve all, to bring everything for the better right now, right here, even within one year, two years, or six years of administration. That is not what it was. But what it was, was it did bring down dictatorship, it did restore democracy, and it did bring us a constitution that was supposed to limit power and to create institutions that were to chase after those who had plundered us and to create an institution that would protect the rights we had lost before. So a proper appreciation for what it was and what it was not. So perhaps to end this lecture, three short phrases we need to understand. No? We need to reclaim the narrative. During a talk I gave at the Bantay ng Bayani, uh, I think it was four years ago, I said, if we remain silent about what has happened, okay, someone else will speak for us. And that someone else might tell a story that it is not, that might not just be tweaking of the truth, but an utter falsity. We need to reclaim the narrative. Many of the textbooks about martial law, about EDSA, it simply narrates perhaps or enumerates accomplishments, but does not really try to analyze. A lot of the, uh, we have, for example, a holiday where it's that, a holiday. It is a no classes, okay, no work, but does it really understand what was it all about? We need to reclaim the narrative and we need to remember our history in the proper context, right? We need to remember what really happened, what it was for, why it succeeded in some things, and why it failed in other things. And perhaps if we remember our history, remember where we have gone after 35 years, remember what is truth, perhaps then can we do the last step to claim our future. To claim our future means what can we do with EDSA in its proper historical context, in the proper narrative of the Filipino people 35 years later? We need to be realistic. We need to be honest. Okay. But we also have to be assertive that we have gone this far. We have accomplished this much. It would be really tragic if we choose to go back the same bad roads we used to. And instead, we need to move forward, claim the future, claim the narrative, shape our history. Okay, thank you.